I've been asked today to talk a little bit about this a particular case study of the um, Great Himalaya Trail, um, which is sharing with you some of the issues and challenges that we have with tourism planning in Nepal. I've lived there myself for over 40 years now and have been involved in the past in the, the private sector operating adventure tourism and more recently working mostly with TRC um, as a consultant throughout the Asia-Pacific region as well as in Nepal. As you can see from, from this map and as many of you know very well, um, our, our issues, our challenges in Nepal have been, um, especially since the 10-year insurgency and more recently the devastating earthquakes of last year and the blockade of last winter, is that we're stuck in a sort of low-end budget tourism um, trap uh, in that the, um, after the problems with the Maoist insurgency, the authorities looked to our neighbours um, to bring back tourism numbers. So all the growth in tourism that we're seeing, which is about 800,000 tourists a year before the earthquake, um, ha has been driven by the Chinese and lower-end East Asian markets. The high-yield European long um, markets, North American, European, or Western markets for have really been in decline. Um, other than in developing products that will attract these higher end segments and to bring a better spectrum of markets, our other issue is that all our tourism is really not that different today as it was when those of you visited 30, 40 years ago. The destinations are still the same and this uh, map sh shows very clearly how the concentration of the, the normally 800,000 people, we are down about a third, 32% down after the earthquake, but is recovering much quicker than predictions. But all the concentration is in the Lumbini, uh, Chitwan, Kathmandu, Pokhara triangle in the middle. And the big issue in the mountains, which is what I'd like to concentrate on today, is that um, all the, almost all the traffic goes to Everest and Annapurna, um, Everest, Everest here, if I've got a light, oops, sorry, not there. Anyway, you know, all know where Everest is and Annapurna Mustang um, in, in the center of the country. Um, Mountaineering is a hugely important part of the tourism mix in Nepal, and you can see here it's not only um, important in numbers, but it's also important in money to an um, underdeveloped and relatively impoverished nation such as Nepal, which so, gr so greatly relies on tourism. Um, the yield from the royalties of Everest is, as you see, around three or four million dollars a year, and um, many, uh, much more when you consider the long stay um, of most of the expedition um, uh, 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 teams who, who are in the country for many months. Um, estimates range between 12 and $15 million of, of value to the country. So that's not to be underestimated. But you see from these um, graphs that we developed for another project actually was is the huge, completely overwhelming pressure on the Everest region. 80% of all climbers are climbing in that region. Um, we have the, the peaks are divided into expedition peaks, as many of you know, and so-called trekking peaks, which are managed by the Nepal Mountaineering Association. So that's how the statistics look. Um, but, the, but a very, very valuable segment, because as we know, mountaineers are... Um, not risk averse, so they continue to come when other tourists have been um, very much more thin on the ground. So very important, <coughs> but a very putting a great deal of pressure on Everest. So a great need to sort of spread out that that pressure. From similarly to New Zealand, um, over seventy-five percent of all our tourism takes place in the protected areas. 
And looking at the mountain areas here, the darker ones is where you get the, the greater visitation. You can see that before, before the earthquake, when Langtang tragically um, has, uh, ha has lost its um, trekking numbers, but before the earthquake, we had um, initially up to 98%, 97% of all mountain visitors were going to Annapurna, Everest, and Langtang. And for, by mountain visitors, we mean mountaineers, trekkers, but also increasingly um, other sorts of visitors as the roads penetrate the mountains um, and many, many pilgrims um, attracted to um, sites in these areas. So we take quite a broad view of mountain, of mountain visitors. The objective of the Great Himalaya Trail, which was started um, 10 years ago now, was to try and spread tourism benefits east and west along the 1,700-kilometer route. The route itself is fairly notional. There is a high route that has, um, was pioneered by um, mountaineers and more extreme trekkers. But from a development perspective, the lower route it was much more important for, for in terms of benefiting local communities because that's the area where we have population. Um, Dawa, Stephen and Appa, as we heard the other day, spent 99 days um, raising awareness of the Great Himalaya Trail as well as awareness of the um, uh, climate change by walking from one end to the other a couple of years ago. The development effort has been a partnership of uh, donors, the um, um, DFID from the UK, um, the Dutch government, uh, United Nations. There's been a number of, of, of donors that have worked, to collaborated together with the um, authorities. Um, lots of energy has gone into training local communities and working with local communities to make sure that the types and styles of tourism that are developed along the trail are of a, um, of a, of a style that can benefit local people. And of course, very importantly, is getting the private sector on board to promote and sell this route. <coughs> In practical terms, it's unlikely the, you know, you, learning from the great walks of other parts of Europe and indeed New Zealand, um, because of the topography, you've got to be pretty dedicated to be walking from one end to the other. But um, the trail is divided into 10 sections, and so the um, more attractive, shorter, uh, easier circuits can be promoted. And the idea is to encourage um, tourists to return over and over again to complete the trail. Lots of training, capacity building with local people, helping them to become guides and uh, um, uh, improving tea houses, um, improving lodges, uh, developing products that, again, appeal to, to that whole, to the wide segment of um, potential tourists getting back some of the um, high profile that we had in the um, 1980s and 90s. Um, and have some of the high spending uh, tourists coming back by developing lodge circuits and um, uh, uh, airstrips and mountain airstrips, helicopter um, drops. So they're trying to appeal to a wide spectrum. The, la the last point I'd just like to make, especially here, having listened to all these fascinating presentations this week, is actually we're grappling with really pretty low numbers. Um, about a quarter of all Nepal visitors go into the mountains, at just under 200,000. <coughs> but of those, we're talking about pressure on the Everest region, but it's actually only 35, 36,000 people every year, even at its height. Annapurna, which is more accessible, um, easier to get at by road, um, is about 130,000 people a year. So it's really management issues that we're grappling with, uh, not so much weight of numbers when we consider how those of you in other parts of the world manage. Um, 
we do have issues with regulations, with controlled areas. We have been looking at that, and as Dave said, interestingly enough, looking at um, different permits, um, we've found the departure tax in Nepal is by far the most successful, easy, and uh, most efficient to collect. Has the Greater Malayan Trail been successful? I think it's probably a bit too early to say. Last year, 15,000 people went uh, to destinations that were not Everest and Annapurna or Langtang. So that's more than there used to be, 8% of all trekkers. So we're sort of heading in the right direction. But I think it will need more, a lot more work and commitment from the private sector and people kind of seeing the benefit of spreading tourism to these very beautiful areas, but areas which are more challenging, logistically challenging, more complex and more expensive to operate. So I think that's perhaps enough just to give you an, give you an idea. Um, and thank you very much.